Maybe, maybe if I put this, maybe it'll look creepy or something. <laughs> into the into the there dime. you go yes there. sir there you go <laughs> that's that, that, that is kind of creepy honestly <laughs> i'm going for i'm going it is october by the way it is rocktober so um yeah. we're 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 going for that we're going <laughs> for the the scare the halloween the rob zombie yes yeah <laughs> that's right <laughs> I tried to download a picture and put you as my background, but my computer wouldn't save my pictures for some reason. It might have been just been me. It might have been um, we're not we're not saving that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, you ready? Yes, sir. All right, three, two, one. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast. Just want to thank all our fans and listeners. We really appreciate all the support. And we are thrilled to be joined today by another legend in the business, an actor and producer with over 140 credits to his name that spans nearly three decades, best known for his roles in the majority of Rob Zombie's films, Domino, and of course, The Walking Dead. Mr. Lou Temple, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dustin. I appreciate being here. It's uh it's our time of the season, right? It's it's October, so uh, this is uh, this is what what we gear up for all year. We kind of play October all through the the twelve months, but when it really shows up, you know, that's that's when we uh, uh, we take our stand. So thank you for having me today on on uh, Don't Go Out There podcast. I'm I'm excited and uh, uh. This is fun. Yesterday was my birthday, so I'm I'm uh, I've got a few clouds in my coffee um, this morning, but I'm I'm happy to be here. <laughs> oh, happy birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we always like to start off all of our interviews with just what got you into acting, Mr. Temple. Good story, uh, and I bet you hear some amazing stories from a lot of your guests, and I I would imagine like snowflakes, they are all different, as is mine. Yes, sir. Uh, I was uh, a young man in, in the midst of a, a really good career uh, in professional baseball, and um, I had been a player all through my childhood and and my my upbringing and and on into college. And I got drafted and went out and played. And I was had played professionally in the minor leagues, and then uh, was working a job in professional baseball for the Houston Astros as a young single man with an expensive report and a car and, and uh, a nice salary and, and single and in a big city. And I followed a young lady into a building. Isn't it always about a girl? Well, yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> and, and into a building to chat her up for a, uh, a date, no doubt. And I saw what they were doing in this in this theater on stage and the light just went off. Well, those are my people and, and I can do that. Look at that. That's what I've been wanting to do my entire life. But I I couldn't do it. <laughs> I mean, I thought I could. Um, so I had to go back to school, college, Brooklyn College and take studies that that gave me a skill set to be able to, to pursue it. But um, it was such an interesting time for me, and, and I offer this to all of your listeners, um, not that it's the, you know, inspiration morning or anything, but uh, you, if you give yourself a chance, it, it, it will happen. Um, it might not be on your time. It might not be on your terms, but for sure, you're going to get her done. And um, I, I don't know what gave me the confidence or the faith that I could do this. Do this. There are times where I still and, you know, think, my goodness, uh, what if I suck today? Uh, but that's not just me. That's, I've sat across from Den, Denzel Washington who said that, you know, so that, that happens. That happens to all of us for, you know. I'm, I'm sure, Nico, occasionally you show up and say, man, what if, what if I'm not very good today? Um, and then you push through. So um, that's a long answer to a short question. What got me into acting a, a tight pair of jeans? 
Um, but <laughs> it weren't mine. Um, but <clears throat> maybe that's what what led me to the watering hole. And then it was up to me to take a drink. So I did have to make a decision to throw an incredible career because I I have a lot of I think a lot of confidence that I'd still be in baseball running one of these teams at the highest level or right. that was, that was my path at least. But um, at that time, I chose to walk away from a really uh, great career that anybody would love to have and also uh, something that was, uh, you know, consistent, that, that was providing me a lifestyle right. and just to walk away from that or through throw all that away and pursue uh, life in the arts, which is entirely walking into the unknown. So right. I, I offer that to anybody. Um, maybe sometimes put your pencil down and walk away. Go right. change, you know, change it up. So, Just curious, yeah. what position did you play? I was a middle infielder. I was, you know, I was always in, in, in high school and college, a shortstop. And then when you get out with some boys that can really play, um, I pushed over and played much more second base. So a uh, little bit of a utility guy at the end where I could play both sides of the bag and, and or pretty much any place else. I ran I ran well. Um, my defensive skills were, were good. I hit three ways, left-handed, right-handed, and seldom. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was a shortstop myself. Everyone was always astonished to see a six-five shortstop, but that—that that was—I loved it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and because it's six-five, we still think that's really long to play short. Yep. You know, the strides. Yep. Because you know, I did learn to go out and and. Uh, you know, look at players to scout players, project them. So we always looked at long, lean shortstops with hope. We were always yeah. looking like this could be our six five shortstop. Like you know, Ripken was really tall. Yep. Um, a Rod you know, six four. Um, Alex, Alex, when he was a shortstop, A Rod was a was a long, was a big kid, tall yeah. kid. Um, we've had some. And we're always looking for another. Uh, they eventually end up on one of the corners, third or first base, you yep. know. So, um, and but I wouldn't mind, you know, running a six-five shortstop out there. Uh, it's funny about center of gravity because you know, you, the closer you are to the earth, the better you're, you're kind of able to grab yeah. something off of it <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, like a baseball rolling across the dirt and so um that plays you know but and then on the other sport like a six foot five shooting guard or you know something that's in the air above you you're more apt to grab it if you're a little more vertically uh blessed <laughs> so <laughs> You were just playing the wrong sport, Dustin. Uh, you know, six five is perfect in baseball. I'd love. Uh, we'll, we'll get a workout and see how you're. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tore I, I tore my UCL years ago, so I think baseball is long gone. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it was fun while it lasted. It's 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 always it's still my first passion. Same. Uh, and uh, I do love to act, and I love films, and I love all genres of movies and storytelling. But I I. Uh, I love baseball. Um, I, that hasn't changed since I was an eight-year-old boy. You know, I, I love the history of the game, and I love the here and now of the game and the players today. And so I have the same dream uh, occasionally about once a month that I did when I was 12 about walking through the tunnels of Yankee Stadium and, and being a major leaguer, my first big league game. And, and I'm not even a Yankee fan. I don't know how that happened. I know how that happened because growing up for me, it was about books and encyclopedias and, and reference books. And they a lot of those were built on the lore of the Yankees from yep. the 30s right. and the 40s and the 50s. And so that just it got ingrained in, in my fabric. And and, um, and and I grew up uh, really a Reds fan, the big red machine kind of in the 70s, but also uh, I'm, I'm a big Braves fan right now in, in my life. And, uh, Same. 
I've, I've had a lot of Astro love because that was the organization that I, I was oh. with. Um, the recent events, their little, uh, uh, their, their, their little indiscretion uh, right. has kind of turned me off with them. So I, I don't root for them so much. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy that we got through the COVID baseball. We're into playoff baseball. Yeah. And we're just now going to start our bubble for playoff yep. baseball and we're going to try to avoid a Tennessee Titans situation yeah. <laughs> right and yeah. keep playing so uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for asking about uh, about that and and uh, how I, I that's my snowflake story about getting started so if you see a girl follow her that's the, <laughs> the lesson in that story is if you ever see a young woman follow her uh, and then um, don't call me for getting thrown in jail as <laughs> stop. that's probably bad advice <laughs> well speaking of all types of genres uh, you started off doing a lot of television um including walker texas ranger uh can you talk a little bit about that i mean it looks like you played a, a lot of different characters throughout that uh tenure yeah that's that's a, a, also a lovely story i started after i went to brooklyn college i came back to where you know um Texas where I was living and, and uh, I, I didn't really have a sense of going to the coast uh, New York or Los Angeles I, I just knew that um, I needed training so I went I got it and then I came back to Texas which would be considered a middle America Midwest type market and at the time I was uh, in Houston Texas which uh, you know I love Houston um, and most of the I suppose acting type of work there was theater one uh, several theaters were available for me to work at uh, small theaters from garage theaters all the way up to small lord houses to a large regional theater theater uh, called the alley theater which i did eventually work at worked my way up to that level and then we did a lot of what were known as industrial films these are films that are are um uh educational for the corporations so this is how to they were typically how not to you know <laughs> like they were safety films for you know industrial uh, companies you know and right. you'd be some numb nut construction worker that wasn't wearing a hard hat you know and and so there was a fair share of that but every now and again there was a commercial that would roll through Texas that we would all audition for um, and then there was one television show being shot in Dallas, Texas, which was Walker, Texas Ranger on CBS, which was a white hat, black hat, good guy versus bad guy, real formulaic, um, but really popular during that time. Right. And um, I wasn't getting much looks at because I'm I'm a little outside of the, the lines. Um, maybe a little quirky, maybe a little squirrely, maybe a little, may, I think they told me a lot. You're not sort of the typical Midwest. What well, in those days, the, it was still about kind of models or the Marlboro man particularly. Right. And right. so if you didn't fit in that mold, you know, it was hard to find something, but I got cast in a commercial for the Texas lottery by a, a director out of New York City that did have a sense of quirkiness and he was building that. So right after that happened, it was it was kind of this, I got invited to go audition at Walker, Texas Ranger and walked in and the casting director was like, oh, we haven't met before. And immediately it was, and she was very difficult, Liz Kegley at the time, she was, <laughs> a, a, not an easy, not a unpleasant person. That's not what I mean. But she had a real specific uh, mandate about what she was going to use for for this show. Interestingly right. enough, um, I don't know if we can do this. I'm gonna. When you walked in to audition for Walker Texas Ranger, and keep in mind this is Chuck Norris, the Chuck right. Norris that right. lead of the show. So he's not like Dustin, he's not vertically blessed. Okay? Right. <laughs> and so when you walked in, there was a there was a mark on the door, fellas. You know, 
could see it was, you know, right about here. And if you were too much, if you were ahead above that mark, which was Chuck's height, you weren't going to get a job on this show. And um, so I fit the height requirements. Let's just say that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, of course, was cast as this ne'er-do-well kind of bad guy on the show, but not the bad guy. They were still flying the bad guy in from Los Angeles. And, but the bad guy might have needed a um, sidekick, and I think that I did that. And I learned immediately, if, if you recall, that show was really stunt-driven. They did a lot of stunts on that right. show. Because that's kind of Chuck's thing, martial arts, obviously, and very physical. There wasn't a lot of gunplay. So uh, I learned a lot about stunts on that show and about there are stunt people that are brought in to do those stunts for you. And when they do those stunts for you, um, they earn their they earn bonuses. That's why they show up. And so oftentimes actors like to do their own stunts, which uh you know, makes them feel like they're complete with with what they're providing. But it also takes an opportunity away from a stunt guy who's there to do that. So I, I, I kind of learned right by the stunt association to defer to the stunt guy. I can try it once. Uh, I can kind of get through it for some close ups. But at the end of the day, that man over there is there to do for me. So. I'm, I've always been grateful that I understood that. Um, Chuck Norris is a great guy. I know we have a lot of jokes about Chuck, and I appreciate <laughs> it just as much as the next guy. But but I'd say this. He's a really solid individual that only wanted the best for the show. He never fancied himself as some you know, Oscar-nominated, Shakespearean-trained actor. He recognized what he was, and he said, whatever I can do to help. He was like a good coach. You know, hey, guys, let's have a great show and anything I can do, let me know. And I, I'm just going to try to stay out of your way as actors who have a better skill set than myself. He was great. So I I really appreciated it. Get it to your point, uh, Brian, about playing different characters. It was a day that they throw a mustache on you. I couldn't grow one back in them days. Uh, <laughs> they throw a mustache on you and have you just as this different character. I mean, it was crazy. So yes, I think I played four or five different characters right. on Walker and nobody seemed to mind. And <laughs> um, I don't know. And we didn't even, you know, we didn't think twice about it. If somebody asked me, I have done two characters in a movie since and been very particular about, well, we've got to make him look different than that guy. And he has to stand different. He has to talk. I didn't do anything different. I just had a mustache and was, <laughs> I suppose, exactly the same. And I find that so comical today to the point where the last character that I played, I think the show got so thin in storyline that Chuck Norris actually had to investigate my death at the hands of Frank Stallone. Um, St Sylvester Stallone's brother, right. yeah. uh, who was the the goomba that was rolling into Dallas and trying to set up his his uh, his gang, and and my gang was infringing on that that space. So um, yeah, but it it was a really good place to cut your teeth because it was national television. Um, fun was that my grandparent. My grandfather in particular could watch that show because he was a fan of that show. It was kind of our grandparents' show. Right. And my granddad, I would get my, my ass handed to me in a in a physical fist fight or a physical fight in the beginning with Chuck. And then towards the end, he'd just have one of his partners roundhouse, roundhouse. And um, <laughs> uh, my granddad would take it personal. He would say, you know, Lou, I can't, you know what's coming. You know he's going to throw around the house and you just stand there, and, you know. And I'm like, granddad, that's what I'm supposed to be. That's really why I'm hired. And uh, yeah, because all his friends would give him a hard time. You're, yeah, look at your boy. He can't fight. He fights just like you. I mean, it was, so there, I had a lot of fun and I, and I have a, a, a lot of, joy in my heart up for that show and it was my start and, and a lot of gratitude as well and it taught me professionalism 
and that show was really tight. They had people that had worked on it a long time, and they they were very efficient. And so I I, I was able to really get exposed to something great in the beginning. So I'm I'm happy for that. They're doing another Texas Walker Texas Ranger, by the way. Um, That's what I heard. It, it, uh, you know, I don't know where they stand with production, but um, I think the young man, Jared, uh, oh, G- G- what's his, G- Galecki? Galecki? Yeah. Oh, wow. Not okay. easy. Yeah, he should have changed that to Temple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a handsome young man. He's going to be the, the, the Texas Ranger. Um of which I have played a Texas Ranger, by the way, just to keep the, the daisy chain going uh, in Lone Ranger. Um, right. Yep. So uh, yeah, I've got my Ranger badge. I don't know. I've got my Ranger. I see it. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So my, my Cinco Star. Um, so I've got some Ranger Ranger rights, let's call them. <laughs> there you go. Mr. Tim, I'm going to transition to the horror genre for just real quick. Um, I thought you, had- you Nico. I'm, I'm, just <laughs> guessing. I'm, I'm looking at your background. I'm just saying, you don't give a hoot about this cowboy stuff. Oh, uh, no, no, no. I, I watched Walker, Texas Ranger. Um, <laughs> you've had an amazing career so far. And on our show, we reviewed three movies you've been in. Oh, and when you. Brian told me that we were, you know, you were coming on the show to do an interview, I immediately just. I, I thought about the roles you played. In 2006, you were in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning. You acted, you were in the same vehicle as the iconic R. Lee Ermey, and you were face to face with Leatherface. And then a year later, you were in the same, you know, room as Michael Myers. So, as a horror fan, I just want to know what goes through your mind outside of, you know, just being an actor on set. What goes through your mind being in two legendary genres? And two legendary franchises with these iconic characters. I just, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, that's a great question, Nico. And uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have been exposed to each of them. Although um, neither of those episodes came out very well for my character. Uh, and uh, even, even, even my person, even Lou, has some bad dreams about those two boys. Uh, you know. And occasionally I get off, I get, and I'm thankful you didn't ask me. So which one, you know, because in oh. their own way, they're they're both formidable, no doubt, but they're scary as hell differently. Um, uh, so let me let me just say that I have uh, done a film previous with Arlie Ermy, so. When Texas Chainsaw and I'd had a great time and got to know uh, Lee pretty well, it, and he was a gunny sergeant. So even though he was a civilian, or uh, you know, he's, he was never a civilian, but even though he allowed us civilians to be part of his life, uh, there was this absolute, you know, you know, you will. Meet me in Marina Del Rey to go fishing at OOP. <laughs> You'll bring both kinds of music, country and Western, you know. And, uh, so, had, I mean, he would talk to you in that cadence and he kind of got your, your, you know, your ears <laughs> up, and your, you know, your snap on. So he was great because he had such a great sense of humor and he was a lovely man and he could read or say anything, you know, his voice, it was just ideal. So I, I really treasured my time with, with Lee. And I had done a movie called on the borderline where we were running, uh, illegal immigrants across the border. And he was a sheriff on a small Texas town that was not in favor of that. So we were pitted up against him and I had a really great time, uh, working with him. So when the opportunity came to come back and work as much with him, I, I actually, when I got the opportunity or the role, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go do this legendary franchise, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I actually didn't think about that. I was like, oh, do I have any scenes with Arlie Ermey? Well, as a matter of fact, all your scenes are with Arlie Ermey. And I'm like, then I will do this. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I didn't think about uh, 
Leatherface, who, by the way, when we did our movie, which is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning, mm -hmm. he was really Tommy Hewitt, oddly, mm -hmm. for, sure. For, sure. for you dug in fans. And so I referred to him as Hewitt almost uh, entirely. Sure. And it was really built on how he comes about, which um, clearly I've had now um, two of these and trying to trying to link the daisy chain now because my time with michael myers was also about who michael myers was uh, or how he became to be and this would be the same with with tommy hewitt so um andrew barnarski of course played uh, our leather face at that time uh very physically big guy um kind of a holy gully a lot of fun uh and so for me, it was the three of us doing that. So, it, it, and I had known Andrew from the convention tour and I had worked with Lee. So we'd had this kind of, you know, simpatico and there wasn't a lot of, we didn't have the kids with us or it, with my work. So it was, it, it was rough and ready dude work. And it, I enjoyed it a lot. And we got, I got to riff. Uh, at some point in a car ride with Arlie Ermey, the director just said, I don't know, just start improvising. We've got this <laughs> long car journey. We can either do it silent or you come up with, it's actually up to you, Lou Temple, you come up with something. <laughs> so I just went on and on and, and I right. think something makes the movie. Um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and Lee just kept silent because, he's kind of a reveal in this scene. And then mm -hmm. oddly enough, what's something that never, un I never understood this was that he steals my identity. If, you know, he takes my, right. my sheriff's outfit uh, and he becomes Sheriff Winston. When I, for me, I was the original Sheriff Winston, you know, um, but it all worked out great. Uh, you know, seeing Andrew, or Leatherface or Tommy Hewitt with that chainsaw. And about the time he turns around with it, it's pretty jarring. It's, it's really like, oh, oh, and you realize you see a chainsaw. And I don't know if this is how it would be in real life, but if this is how it felt, I only had a pistol. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you know, for most of us, a 357 Python is enough. But some reason, him and that chainsaw, I felt <laughs> a little unarmed. <laughs> and um, and then when our, Lee says, "Hey, Sheriff, we got a problem," and, you know, uh, then I really did have a problem. It was great. I think <laughs> when you have a guy like Lee in that those scenes, um, he kind of mandates not just respect but also a, a level of like you got to bring your a game and right. and and not just for me or andrew but you know I, i've heard stories when he was doing like seven with with brad pitt and morgan freeman right you know that that happened as well and so uh, you get what that is so it was as much an experience i think you you referenced our lee or me as uh and not on that movie, but on the previous movie that we had done, we um, had a couple of adult beverages one night and several cigars. And I did get him to do his gunny sergeant speech from Old <laughs> Jacket, which oh, was yeah. unbelievable. Actually, he did it entirely for a crowd, and the crowd was mesmerized. It was ideal. So Texas wow. Chainsaw Massacre was great. Um, a lot of when I saw that movie, I couldn't believe how violent it was. I mean, it, it was really, and I had done some Rob Zombie stuff up to that point, but that particular movie, for some reason, to me, just struck a really violent chord. Um, going across the street to Michael Myers' house, uh, of course, an entirely different uh, director and ensemble with Rob Zombie, I was honored, you know, Rob had, I, I had, he had committed to Tyler, he'd cast Tyler, and I feel like he had cast Danny Trejo, 
and I might have been the third guy that he cast. And so I remember going in immediately and meeting with him and him letting me know. And and uh, I'm going to flip you and Trejo because we had done the Devil's Rejects by this point. And he said, you know, I want you to be the jerk. I want you to be the uh, the the asshole, essentially. And, and I'm going to have Danny be the sympathetic character. And so I don't know what you're going to do to be the asshole, but you pardon me for using that language. Oh, no. we, we've, a, said, we've said way worse. But <laughs> we all know. It's October. Come on. <laughs> right. uh, so, uh, he said, you know, find something. And, of course, you know, I kind of pushed the, the race card, the Mexican card on Danny and just became that real irritant. Um, and then uh, silent and violent Michael Myers is – also very formidable and for rob just whatever scenario we could build to make it um disarming you know to make it uh, foreboding was great and so i felt like he kept pushing me to keep pushing tyler or michael myers keep pushing and so that was really interesting because where the sheriff winston character in Texas Chainsaw Massacre was just a, a really a guy that wanted to get home to dinner. And this was a pain in the ass to have to go out and find Tommy Hewitt, especially after what he just done. Um, the tard to going <laughs> over. I'm going to get, I'm going to engage Michael Myers, this big dummy that doesn't talk this idiot. Um, I'm going to be the little guy that gets the big guy under my thumb. I'm going to be the little guy that controls the big guy. That was my modus operandi. And and I'm going to get him to do some bad things, just like I'm going to do some bad things. And then I've got some bad things on him. And then he's going to become like me, and I'm going to do all this. And that seemed to work, you know, especially as right. you get into Rob's cut where you get to see the unpleasantness of, of that rape scene. Mm-hmm. Which the Weinstein's actually, I know I'm talking about <laughs> Harvey Weinstein was right. nervous about that for the female audience, and he came to Rob and he said, "Look, I, I, I think we alienate some of our audience here. Can we adjust it?" And Rob's like, "It's kind of what I built," and they. They just offered him a lot of money to rebuild something. Rob said, "Oh, sure, give me a chance." <laughs> right. Bill and Leslie and 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 Tom Towles, God rest his soul, and and um, and do some some more mayhem. So um, the rape scene was very difficult. I give Rob all the credit because he made it as easy as possible. Uh, the young lady that he used was from his uh, SS werewolf woman, uh, the the uh, the grindhouse. Uh, teaser video that they did you remember yes. and yes. The, the girl that bill mosley was working on so she had had exposure with rob and she had had exposure <laughs> nudity <Gotcha. laughs> so yeah. and um and so we were uh, uh we were able to have a some level of comfort you know no one likes to be touched or you know they're right as professional as we could uh, in very difficult situations, Rob made it better, uh, and and you know at some point, I can remember talking to Malcolm McDowell that day, and he's like, "Look, if you have to play Hitler, you know, you've got to do the job right. You've got to do it well. You've got to do it with everything you've got." And I'm like, "Okay, you know, all right, you know." So, <laughs> uh, and it was really about my approach was really ugly based on a childhood that I'd had and probably some, some abuse um, to get Michael Myers engaged in that kind of frenzy. And then of course it spins on us. Interesting story. Even still uh, Danny and I had been hanging out in the trailers all morning and Danny was telling me about his upbringing. There's a great new documentary series or documentary. I think it's called the rise of Danny Trejo and it's really good. Uh, it's about his up his background, his upbringing, and how he comes to be such a uh, cinematic legend. 
And one of the things for most of you who do know that Danny spent some time in the pan, um, and he told me about like when you would go to use the facilities, especially doing a number two, uh, you take your your not just your trousers but your underwear off and hang them up, so that if someone was coming at you, you were free for for running and not get caught with your pants down around your ankles, not yeah. getting caught with you. That's where the term getting caught with your pants down if someone's going to shiv you. So I decided that I would make that the play with Michael Myers, that my tidy whities were going to be around my ankles, and that was what was going to slow me up, that he could catch me and crush my skull into that cement wall. Tyler Maine is a huge man. You're 6'5", Dustin. Mm-hmm. I think he's 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, and physical, not like he's he's an ex-athlete and a wrestler. And he can get you and throw you. He can get his huge hand in the small of your back and just toss you. <laughs> you can yeah, take fly. We, we actually had him on the show, and he's a physical presence just over Skype. So, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine in person. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so he is, and he's a lovely human being. And, right. Um, So we had to do that kind of work, and he was, you know, he was used to it because he's been in the ring wrestling, and I'm like right. freaking out, and he's like, "Dude, you're gonna be okay." And um, <laughs> and before I know it, he was he was really good at killing me. Uh, <laughs> too too good, I would say too good. Uh, so so that that was that was uh, you know really fun. Uh, the work was great. Um, working with Rob is always is is always great. The, the time with Danny was was a lot of fun. You know, I'm not proud of the racist types of things that I offered his Latin character, but it fit the roles. Um, we had a scene where we had to bring him into a board for consideration of of uh, appeal for release. Um, and, and it was a scene with uh, Clint Howard and a scene with Udo Kuhr. And um, I'm trying to think who else was in that scene, but some cool actors. They didn't make the movie, but it was really fun being with these kind of uh, rock star legends in that in, in those confines. And to be with Danny and Tyler, it was it was uh, I'm proud of it. I am proud of it. And, and that was the most indecent thing I'd ever done on film. Not no in my life. Right. Scratch that. In my life, Noel Clugs, um, up to the point where I do 31. Uh, then, yeah. then Psycho Head erases the chalkboard and rewrites it. So, Sorry, Nico. That's a long, long answer to your, your comparison. Oh, no, that's perfectly fine. Thank you. Uh, that was amazing. Go ahead, yeah. Go ahead Dustin. <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned Rob Zombie, and as you can see by my background, I'm a huge Rob Zombie fan. I'm uh, watching so what I say just because it seems like he's le- right there. Like, like he's watching. <laughs> like, yeah, give me the e- evil eye like the stink eye if, if I give a wrong answer. It's like that's not – I'm never hiring you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I got to ask about how it all came to be. So Rob seems to be one of those guys that if he uh, – he really trusts his actors and continues to bring them back throughout – uh, various films for different roles, and you've been one of them. How did that first role as Adam Banjo in The Devil's Re- Rejects? How did that come to be? That's that's another great question. I give you I give you all a lot of credit, and I hope your listeners do too, because I do a lot of these, and your questions are on point. And I appreciate it. It it makes it not just better for your audience, it makes it better for your guests. And, and so, congratulations, and keep doing that. Whatever you're doing, however your research is, or however you round table to get these questions um keep doing it because it 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 makes for a better day thank you that means a lot i had been uh i just come to los angeles and i had been kicking around and trying to find my place in my patch of grass out here in la and and kind of as a southern actor and i think three of you can appreciate that it, right it's a whole new culture experience and exchange but uh, a casting director knew me from Texas because she had come in and cast a movie called 
serving Sarah. Now, this casting director's name is Monica Mickelson. She's excellent, and she was Rob Zombie's casting director at the time. And she had cast me in a movie called Serving Sarah with Al, uh, uh, Matthew Perry and Elizabeth Hurley. And interesting, the role that I was cast in was like this uh, hotel clerk. Elizabeth Hurley's checking into the hotel. Her credit cards are all denied. She has no way of paying. And I'm um, I'm just sitting there saying everything's been declined, ma'am. I'm sorry. Do you have any cash for the night? And she's like, no, but I have these. And she shows me her goods, her bits. And um, and that's good enough. <laughs> uh, I I got very sick um, with and, and not like a cold. I, I got I got cancer. I got leukemia during the course of this movie being filmed and I was in the hospital. Oddly enough, Matthew Perry also got sick um, with uh, drug addiction. <laughs> right. So right. he was he was doing rehab. The whole movie was on hold and the bet was who's coming out first, Lou Temple or Matthew Perry, <laughs> Lou with cancer, Matthew with drug addiction. Matthew won. I never did make the money movie, but uh, Monica replaced me with a, a little known actor named Mike Judge at the time out right. of uh, out of Austin. So he got to do the Elizabeth Hurley thing. I know this makes no sense, but Monica Mickelson, the casting director who cast that, remembered me. And when Rob was casting for Adam Banjo and Devil's Rejects, she called me in. In those days, they would send you the script. And you typically went in to meet with the... Uh, the director and Rob was kind of a little before his time as this goes, but he, 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 feel, he feels as a performer, he feels not kind of humbled and not appropriate to be in front of somebody while they're presenting or performing. Who am I to sit in front of you and judge and be, you know, oh, wow. he, he, he just never, so he always had you go on tape for him. And today in the environment, even before COVID, but especially after COVID, that's just the norm now. He's He kind of set the standard. Um, she had called me in, so I go to her office, and I'm going to read. Now, keep in mind, it was also a time they send you the script. So I've read The Devil's Rejects by this point in time. The first page is this giant dragging a, a nude corpse through the woods and i'm like oh my i'd never seen anything like this in my all my live long day i right. mean i had just read it by the way i'd only read it and i was freaked out <laughs> so i'm like what the heck but i know it's a good casting director i vaguely know rob zombie by the way by his music, music. So i don't right. know rob zombie because maybe it's not our least type of music, country and west. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> uh, so I show up and there's two guys, Jeremy Davies and Steve Zahn, like auditioning. I'm like, holy cow, I know I've loved these guys work. I know these guys work. And I'm I wonder what they're re what they're reading for the same thing I am. Oh, oh, wow. I better kick it up a notch. Bam. Uh, it got serious just real quick. So um, anyway, I did the best I could, but it landed with the casting director who took it to Rob. And then I immediately went to Austin, Texas and to see my buddy, Jesse Dayton. And I think it was South by Southwest and we were kicking it. And, and um, I get a call from Monica. Rob really liked your tape and, and you're in the running. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Still not really having a sense of like that did you read the first page because <laughs> you know <laughs> and so like two days later she called and she said I, it's pretty much gonna happen you're the guy rob sort of thinks you're adam banjo and i'm like oh and then i got really i guess i i was nervous about saying yes you know yeah. like committing and I called a friend of mine who I'd known. I know I'm this bunny trail kind of, I, I, everything I do is like this extension. 
uh, I had been up for a film called The Apostle that Robert Duvall directed. And it was a role by the name of Sam. And it ultimately went to a guy who I had been auditioning with. It went to a, an actor, an incredible actor named Walton Goggins, who became right. a, a friend of mine. And so I called Walton Goggins because he had done House of a Thousand Corpses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My favorite scene in House of a Thousand Corpses, the execution with the camera going up into the clouds with Bill Mosley, uh, with Walton. So I called Walton. I said, Walton, my God, uh, <laughs> this Bob Zombie is wanting me to do this movie. And um, I'm a good Christian boy from the South. And I, I don't know if I can go work for this devil worshiper. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I literally said that, and he he did just what you did. He laughed, and he said, oh, boy, do yourself a favor. Um, you're going to have such a creative experience. It's going to be great, and you're going to have a friend for life and Rob. And truer words are never spoke. I said yes, and, and it, it all went really, really well. So, um, But it wasn't without a little trepidation, that being said. And... I had no idea uh, what it in, entailed until I sat in on the table read and, you know, you get the cast together or used to. These are I'm glad that I've had the experience of the used to's because you used to do a lot of these things. And today they're they're kind of right. moved by. But we used so the cast is together. Sid Hay, God rest his soul, is there. Um, William Forsyth, uh, Bill Mosley. Ken Foray, uh, Jeffrey Lewis. I mean, we're talking about an all-star team. And man, when they started singing, when they started saying those words, the bar got raised real high. You know, I'm talking Dustin high. And, <laughs> and right away, you started to recognize this is really. And I think that's, and, and right at that point, Rob understood, but also we all understood this could be something different, of which it is. Let's be honest. We all feel like it is a classic. And um, yep. But right at that table read, we recognize. And it made the rest of us bring beyond our A game. So um, an amazing experience. Um, getting to know Rob, getting to work with Rob, um, him having so much trust in in our characters and, and in our, our artists to develop these characters. You know, he always says, look, I'm the director, you're the actor. I can help you with the intention, but I'm really relying on you to bring the, be the bean dip, you know? <laughs> right. And so, um, so things, so Adam Banjo was certainly on, on the page framed out, but the, the details were maybe missing. So the idea that, that we were going to build this arc for Adam where he's full of bravado and he's, a, you know, he's cocksure and he's this loud mouth going in, you know, um, you, you know, those local cousin fuckers can kiss my ass in the front of it. Then the shit hits the fan and pukes. You know, Rob asked me, if you saw an execution, what do you imagine would happen? I said, I, I'm fairly certain I'd lose whatever was in my stomach at the time. Next thing I know, I've got Campbell's clam chowder being shoved down my throat oh. and we're doing a throw up scene. <laughs> and and um, to to having to, you know, put or put his wife's skirt on when the shit hits the fan to having to cowboy up and man up in the fight with Otis out at the chicken ranch, which was mm -hmm. noble and great and calling for his best friend. And I, I feel like it just all worked, you know, and it worked because Rob allowed us that, that freedom to experience and explore that as opposed to just saying, no, I got to get to this. So right. um, that those were so important working with Jeffrey Lewis, you know, he had a card that said, I'm Clint, Clint Eastwood's best friend. It's, you know, <laughs> uh, he would say things to me like, you know, when you work with the lead of a movie, always put your hand on his shoulder when you say something to him. That way you can't get cut out of the movie. You know, uh, <laughs> just pearls of 
delightful advice. Also, if I can just take a moment, sorry about this, but no. in I had never had that experience in that genre, so I had never ever actually done a horror movie. I had been a horror fan, but certainly not like the three of you, I'm going to guess. I understood Frankenstein and and Dracula and the Wolfman, and those were important to me like any childhood. Um, I had seen, um, you know, Day of the Dead and been scared, very scared of it. But I wasn't seeking it per se, and certainly as uh, as an adult actor, I wasn't looking for that genre, and I didn't necessarily understand that it it had a certain it has a, a tone that is important. But watching Bill Mosley and Ken Foray and Sid Haig and William Forsyth and Jeffrey Lewis work in that genre. There's, they have this impending push into your personal space. It's ever so subtle, but I recognized that I would watch them, and soon they're in your, they're invading your space, and they're making you feel very unnerved, which shows up on camera, and it's, right. it's brilliant, and I'd never seen it before. It's even so subtle as just a lean. I just watched Haig just take his frame and lean a little and it and I could see Mosley doing it and I recognize this it's great technique and I'm so happy you know baseball baseball gave me a skill of observation I was a little guy that had to understand how to survive in a in a sport that required some strength not NFL strength but very near or not NBA height, but very near. And that made me observe what is it they do and how do I overcome what they do to what I can do. And I've always had that. And so on set, I observe a lot. And I'm so grateful to have seen that and for to pick up because I've always brought it and I offer it to you. Is, that's another reason when you have these greats, and I'm saying greats, greats in that genre right. that are that are doing that and they're not talking about it like I'm talking about it now. They're right. not offering it. They're not taking little Lou Temple aside and going, you know, uh, Lou, you know, Bill Mosley's not saying, you know, Lou, if you do this and you push into someone's personal space, it'll really, the camera picks it up and it'll, it'll be very creepy and unnerving. No, I, I just got to see it and I'm, I'm proud that I did and grateful that I did. So that's a big part of why that movie also is a success because they were great right. working in that field. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's funny you brought up the business card because I actually have one that says Lou Temple's best friend. I just haven't really, you know, shinned it out, sent it out to a bunch of people yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, best friend is, is, uh, jeez, <laughs> who is it? Uh, Rob Zombie. I'm going to say no, Rob. There you go. <laughs> He's looking at you. Yeah. Um, let's shift gears I, a little I, bit. That's why I said it. He's got the pearl. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just shifting gears a little bit, yeah, your new film, Limbo, um, for a smaller budgeted film, the cast you have there is great. I mean, you got Richard Rail, Scott, Scotty Thompson from 12 Monkeys, and of course, you know, the legend, Veronica Cartwright from Alien and Hitchcock's The Birds. Can you talk a little bit about that film? Yeah, that's so great. It's out right now, and um, you can see it on, on iTunes, and I think it's on um, uh, maybe Hulu, uh, your red box delivery, whatever that is these days. Uh, it's, right. it's out there on, on a variety of, of platforms. Uh, this was a very small movie that was built by another friend of mine who I work with often, Mark Young. Mark is a writer director and he writes and I like his sensibility. It lands with me. His material does. And thankfully and fortunately, again, he seems to like my sensibility. So he always kind of builds something in there with me in mind. So he sends it to me immediately when he writes. And I probably read it, you know, first before any of the rest of the cast. And I was immediately taken by the subject matter, which essentially is your soul being on trial, your soul being on trial. Uh, which way you're going, north or south. And it's kind of a courtroom drama about your soul between heaven and hell being um, head up by the uh, 
the prosecuting attorney, the devil, uh, one of his minions, and um, the defense attorney uh, coming in from heaven, an angel. Uh, so this was subject matter perfect. It was ideal and, and very apropos for the time that it's out now. When we did it, there was no COVID incidences, but, um, right. but it, as it comes out, it's rather appropriate because most of us have been in limbo and continue to be in some state of limbo. Right. Uh, so it was a small movie, but because of the content and the interesting uh, subject matter, I think it drew a lot of, of interest. And again, a really good casting director, Shannon McCaney, and was able to, it's, it's oftentimes about getting the material to the artist. You know, there's so many checkpoints through agents and managers and attorneys that it's hard sometimes to get your material to. Uh, but when an artist ultimately reads something they like, they'll sign off on it. Um, so keep trying, you writers out there, and find a way. You will do it. Uh, you'll get your script to me. And so it, it, it attracted a lot of interest. When I originally read the script, uh, there's a, a hard-boiled, seen-it-all, done-that uh, attorney by the name of Balthazar that works in this purgatory state for, for uh, Lucifer, and I thought it would be great for me to play kind of this hard-boiled old guy. And Mark was like, yeah, you w you'd you actually be really good at it. You'd be great. But I'm thinking about going much younger and having a juxtaposition like an old experienced guy in the form of a young kind of rebellious teen angst type of guy who has father issues. And I'm like, wow, that's brilliant, of course. And, and he found Lucian Collier, who's delightful in this. And he said, by the way, I kind of wrote Jimmy for you. And I'm like, oh, of course you did. Yeah, that, that'll be great. And then, um, you know, we wanted to find somebody so angelic to play the angel, Cassiel. And um, Scotty is just amazing. Um, you know, she's got these great eyes. And they're very soft and they're very alluring. And she has, but she also has sort of a clinical approach in this movie. So it's it's really um, and she can be vulnerable, so it, it works. And speaking of eyes, Veronica Cartwright, you know, there's actors that have incredible eyes, mm -hmm. and, and she's certainly, like, I, they should do these list all things and just go eyes. And, <laughs> because Veronica would be on that list, like Meg Foster would be on that list. And... Um, and so Veronica was great. And she can, they're not only gorgeous, but they can be steely and hard. Like when she drops into uh, uh, anger or ire, it really, bang, it's right on you, man. And so she uh, was great and really a, uh, you know, just such a gift to work with her. And then Richard is just adorable. He's like this teddy bear. And everything he said, he was the comic relief in the movie. So um, everything he said was funny. In fact, there's a lot of funny stuff that didn't make the movie. Uh, but he's he's so delightful. We were thinking about using him as Balthazar as well, but we just realized, oh, he's just so cuddly that we want, you know, we can't have him be just so hard boiled and disconnected. But he he's fantastic. And then our guest that came in, it was almost like guest stars that came in in the form of uh, uh, Chad Lindbergh, um, who plays the the, the pimp, uh, and uh, Andrew Miller, who plays my father uh, as well. They, they were all just excellent. The challenge with this movie is that it's in, it, the bulk of it's done in a very confined area, in a small room, interrogation room, the, the courtroom, as it were, and there wasn't a lot of options to move about. So there was a certain confinement to purgatory uh, that we had to convey emotions just through our face, not getting up and walking around. And that, that definitely was a challenge. But I'm really proud of it. And I think the message lands and the idea of where, you know, if your life is going to be judged, how will it be judged and is there any redemption that 
you have that you can count on. You have any savings in the redemption account. That's that's the key. Awesome. So I know you're probably tired to death, no pun intended, of being asked this question, but we've got to at least touch on The Walking Dead. Your role as Axel is beloved by fans. How do you reflect upon your time with that series and that role in particular? Yeah, I mean, I'm so, again, thankful and grateful to be part of that franchise, to be part of that <clears throat> that audience you know we on the show we don't really we don't refer to the audience as fans because they're such a huge part of the show we kind of offer them as you know the audience they're they're the the fourth wall and there's a simpatico uh relationship they they instinctively know what needs to happen i think the show recognizes that and makes it happen so it's really important. And so now I am part of the audience, having been part of the other side of the show, but have become part of the audience. So I recognize that. Uh, and I'm very grateful. Um, it, <clears throat> it's something so unique that I had worked a lot before I came to The Walking Dead. And I had not experienced something that had so much camaraderie, or something that had so much focus on we must get this right so much everyone pulling on the same side of the rope so much familial sensibility um no, no hierarchy no divas everybody from the producers to the writers the directors the cast hair and makeup wardrobe camera department sound uh support staff everybody is part of the family and pulling in the same direction and over the course of time i think that the show's done very well of maintaining that idea maintaining that effort so that it's never gotten out of control the show clearly has been as popular as there's ever been but they've also maintained that sense of self of what, who we are and what we are so for instance my opinion is when the show started with the little six episode first season, uh, the three actors, uh, uh, Andrew Lincoln, Sarah Wayne Callies, John Barenthal, got together and said, look, <clears throat> we're doing a show about walkers. They don't even let us call them zombies here. They're called walkers trying to establish their own brand. And who's going to watch this? And but let's do the best we can. For six episodes, we're actually getting a chance to be on TV. Let's give it our all. Let's give it our all. Let's let's make this Shakespeare. Let's let's make this Oscar nominated performance. And they did. And lo and behold, it landed. It landed. And it didn't change. So the next season they bring in, you know more pieces and that idea continues and maintains. So by the time I got there in season three, that baton gets passed on and I'm like, yeah, of course, that's great. And it's, you're welcomed into the show. Hey brother, man, we've been waiting for you. We can't wait. You're gonna be so great. We need you, we need you. And you're, you're invited in. And oftentimes when you come in as a guest, you're kind of a stepchild, you know, you're kind of like, I don't know how, where I fit, and I'm just this, you know, guy said, okay, do that, we'll, we'll see you at the rap party. And th that's not the case with The Walking Dead, which was great, and, and, and it makes you really validate your work, and it makes you feel really part of something that you care, and caring about something makes all the difference in the world, because that yeah. care translates into passion, and then once you have passion, you have fire, and then once you have fire, you have acceleration and that's what happened on this show so i give andrew and and sarah and john credit for starting that but also for maintaining that <clears throat> andrew never changed his approach he, he never changed his work habit it must be right i watched him you know the season three was where he was you know wrestling with the ghost of of lori uh and it was a lot of work and I watched him try so much and get it wrong, sometimes very comically get it wrong.
but he kept he kept with it he kept after it and and he's he's the tom brady of the walking dead you know he's the g-o-a-t he's the goat uh and that that is why the show is as good as it is and i i I recognize that again, an observation I was able to see there's, there's the guy that, that delivers the mail every day. And, um, and he never failed and his work is tireless and, and it's really good, but it's, it's a lot of work. So collectively we're out in the environments of Georgia and y'all are right there. You're in, you're right on the border. You're right on the, on the, uh, the Florida Georgia line, you know, it gets a little warm and humid oh, and miserable. sun. It, it, you're exposed and there's bugs and there's dehydration and there's sun exposure and we're out in the midst of all of it and by the end of the day we're we're beat up and we're done but we recognize what we did and there's this collective <sighs> exhale wow we did it and we're very proud of what we did and then we look at each other and we say we got to do better next week what if we get canceled what if they don't, you know, so there's just that and it just keeps in that. So that's my reflection on The Walking Dead. Of, and people ask me all the time, what do you take from it? And I took friendships. I took relationships. I took friendships with Vincent Ward, who's a very dear, dear friend and a, and a guy that I, has my back. I got his forever and all. Uh, Norman Reedus. uh he and I have had so much fun together and, and so much art together and Andrew Lincoln and just the connection and um, Sarah Wayne Callies and, and I used to smoke cigars a lot with Scott Wilson, God rest his soul, you know, and and reflect on on his career. And so it's just such a gift entirely to have had the opportunity to be around um, these people and this production. So, you know, when I saw it originally, Nico was that it, it came across my desk based on my horror background as a uh, graphic novel, as, as you probably knew it. And I looked at it and I said, ah, oh, it's really good. It's wow. It's really violent. It's really violent. And someone said, yeah, they're making a TV show. And I said, no, I'm not of this, you know, they, they can't put this on television. <laughs> Um, but yeah, good luck. And lo and behold, and I guess I think that the characters are so well defined and rich. You know, we tune in for the characters and, and we get um, side dishes with the walkers ultimately because it's about the people. Um, when I auditioned originally for The Walking Dead, I was brought in to read for the character of Merle and um, and to do that monologue up on the roof. And and, and thankfully, Michael Rooker uh, was available. They, they got used to him. But a few weeks later, they had called me in to uh, read for uh, Merle's brother, who didn't have a name. He didn't even have any lines. Just read Merle again, but different. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> thankfully, Norman Reedus was available for Daryl. So ultimately, the casting and the production was pretty well aware of me by then. And when Axel came around, they had a good idea that 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 I might be a good fit for that. Uh, at the time, I, I had mentioned I was doing Lone Ranger and um, I was working for Disney. And we this was the Fitzcarraldo of, of modern day movies. We were that we were just continuing to do the Lone Ranger all year. And um, I had a Walking Dead said, we'll work with your dates. And I said, OK, well, I appreciate that. But I'm concerned about the mustache because I've got this cowboy handlebar mustache and I can't shave it off. And it's perfect right now. And I've had it for a year. Uh, you know, I know you're going to ask me to shave. And they're like, no, no, no. I was really just bartering for more money. But um, <laughs> he said, no, no. So I said, I said OK. And they did like, you know, Axel. Axel's mustache precedes him. Uh, the Waxel, I call it. Um, so, so that was, it was just so much fun. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really proud to have been part of it and grateful. 
and happy with what we did with Axel. You know, at the time I was brought in, um, they wanted a little comic relief, but not too much. Uh, certainly, they're you know they they don't want to cross the line into silly, and so they they just wanted somebody colloquial that wore his heart on his sleeve. Which you know I think Axel always said what people thought. Mm-hmm. And then in his end, I was really proud with what we did because it was it was certainly shocking. I just wanted it to catch people off guard, and I, I thought we did that. I remember ha- having watched the Zabruder tapes and and seeing the Kennedy assassination and thinking, damn, that just always grabbed me. And so I wanted a headshot like that. Plus, I didn't want to reanimate and become a walker so that, uh, you know, uh, Carl could come out and steal my mustache so he could impress Beth. No. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was spectacular. It was really a, a, a real gift to be on the show. Mr. Temple, can you talk to us a little bit about the Texican? It seems like it's something very you're very passionate about. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm nothing if not a storyteller. And uh, I just decided what I'd like to do is engage in people's stories because I'm interested. I'm interested in your story. Uh, I'm interested in, in Dustin's story. I, I, uh, I was interested in Brian's story, but he uh, is he still with us? I think. He had to go take his son to a football game. Gotcha. Now I'm interested in that. It's football season. Yeah. Uh, so um, I wanted to build something or I want to build something. I'm in the process of pe- getting people – in the mind of their story. Um, when I did Rango, there's a great line in this movie. It's an animated feature that I, I adore. Uh, and the spirit of the West modeled after Clint Eastwood played by Timmy Oliphant, Timothy Oliphant. Uh, no man can walk out on his own story. And I think that's true. You have a story to tell. You must tell your story. So I set the Texan up on Patreon. It's a subscription based website that you can subscribe to for five bucks and you get to engage in beginning to tell your story whether it's writing your great american novel or your screenplay or your idea or your thoughts Uh, i'm going to do some writing on there you're going to get to see my stuff behind the scenes of things that that i do or expose uh, the audition process maybe i'm auditioning for stranger things and i'm going to walk you through that about how I go about that, what it what it takes uh, for me and my approach. Um, I'm going to try and get you to be uh, active and participate on it, and and you know, and let's start building stuff. You know, ideally, I want to I want to grow it to where it it becomes a little production house, you know, ultimately. But I I don't want it to be mine. I want it to be ours. Is my point, mm-hmm. and that's you know. That's why I'm inviting you to uh, to join. But I think when you pay to join something, you expect. And if you expect, then you engage. So then it's just a moderate five bucks. But, uh, but that's going to make you uh, participate, so mm-hmm. to speak. So, yeah, uh, I want you to, to be part of the Texican Nation. So I'm inviting everybody. It's on Patreon. Um, Lou Temple, it's called The Texican. So if you'd like to get engaged and tell your story, I would love, we would love to have you all part of it. All right. So thank you for asking on that, Nico. I appreciate that. Oh, yes, sir. Appreciate that that opportunity and that platform. Absolutely. So I got to ask also about your your new film, Time Crafters. I don't know much about it, but it looks like you play uh, Professor Ratliff in an almost like Goonies slash Treasure Island type film. Is that accurate? You nailed it, Dustin. You, I think you've seen a, a, a screener. Um, this is a, a modern day Goonies. We've, we've modeled it. It is pirates and time travel. Awesome. So it's, uh, it's Goonies meets Back to the Future. Uh, we've got our, our, our two pirate vessels engaged in a, in a battle. Uh, they are, uh, pitted against each other one's got the map and the other has a very strange apparatus on it 
that Professor Ratliff has concocted. It's a time machine. Of course, we've got the vortex in 1700s, and one of the ships gets transported to seaside, modern-day, uh, coastal, small Renaissance town experiencing their pirate days. So these pirates blend right in amongst all the, the uh, reenactors, so to speak. But they're looking for this treasure, of which our five heroes, all being 12, find. And the hijinks ensue. Ultimately, the other pirate ship comes with the, uh, the dastardly Captain Lynch, played by Malcolm McDowell, um, comes to find the, the pirate booty and chasing the young children. We have got our swashbuckling Lynn type played by Eric Balfour and our, our local heroine putting on the Pirate Day plays uh, played by Denise Richards. And so it's uh, Patrick. Star, Moore, star studded. It is. And it's so much fun. I got to not just be um, a cast member, but I also became a producer on this. So I was very engaged in in the production, in in the writing, in casting, in uh, contracts, in scheduling, and edit, and now in the point of sale, which we're very close to having, and we would look for this to be uh, available in the spring. Oh, I wanted it out so badly on Netflix right now because we're all looking for, um, well, those of us with children are looking for family content, and this is a perfect adventure film. Uh, our actually, you cast our five children are our stars, um, and so these kids are are really great, and, and uh, we're excited to present them to the world. So look for Time Crafters, the um, uh, Treasure of Pirates Cove, coming out soon in the spring, and and you won't be disappointed because uh, who doesn't love Goonies, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. I love it. And uh, it's a great childhood. By the way, they're also, I know I, I walkered you, and now I'm going to Goonie you. Uh, they're redoing <laughs> Goonies as well in a television show. Interesting. Uh, okay. I don't I don't know. That's, a, that's iconic. That's going to be a tough one. Okay. I agree. I agree. <laughs> but, you know, we got to try. <laughs> yeah. So one more fun question. Uh, we've had a lot of guests, and our answers for these have been all over the place. So we try to ask every every guest we can. Uh, you obviously have done a lot of conventions over the years. Is there anything that stands out as funny or just strange that you've had happen to you or seen happen to someone else at one of these conventions? <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that sign. I saw the sign. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Uh, <laughs> let's start with strange and then go. Um, let's start with strange. There was a guy. I can't recall his name. He he had he had reached out to several of us in the mail as a fan. To request, uh, <clears throat> I guess, an autograph, but with an autograph, a hair clipping. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and then he shows up at conventions asking for hair clippings. But not from some hot chick, from, you know, from shit kickers like myself, but particularly like Bill Mosley. And then it turns out this guy is a criminal. Oh. Oh, Plant, my God. Planting DNA. <laughs> I mean, wow. absolutely bizarre. So that, that takes the cake for the strange factor. I think uh, you took the cake from everybody for a strange incident. <laughs> yeah. So that's the strange. Um, uh, the the funny things are, you know, there's so many funny things. For me, the funny, I think the funniest thing, it's not so much funny, but at some point it's to throw your hands up. I get continually get this at every convention. There is, and God bless their soul, there is a fried green tomatoes fam, okay? And will bring me D. Mostly it's a VHS, to be honest. And uh, can you sign this, please? And I'm like, I can. I will. But uh, just so you know, I'm not in it. Oh, you were my favorite in it. And I'm like, no, I'm actually not in. There's this actor who I bear a resemblance of uh, named Rainer, 
shines. His name is really Rainer Shines. Uh, <laughs> and I am not. I know. It almost seems un, impossible. So it, He's like 27 years older than you. Yeah, I know. And so, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so I have to, at first I would argue, we'd be a half hour. And then, no, but that is you. And I'm like, it even sounds like you. And I'm like, I don't, okay, yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, you signed at Lou Temple. Your name's Rainer Shines. What do you, you know? And I'm, <laughs> so I've gone through, um, I, I've gone through a fair share of that. There, it wasn't so funny as, you know, you, you always learn a lesson. In the beginning for The Walking Dead, uh, one of my really fun lines, of course, was, uh, well, you must be a lesbian. You got the short hair. You know, that was funny, right? And and so I guess it was just my go-to signature line in in the beginning because everybody was tickled by it. And I didn't realize that maybe not everybody didn't see the show. <laughs> And took it for literal. <laughs> so I would be signing these things. And some dude, an older gentleman, took offense because I'd signed it to his wife, who as an older lady had a kind of a bob haircut. <laughs> and he, you know, he had fathered several children. And clearly she was not. But because I said she was, he wanted to take issue with that. Or written it, by the way. It's written now. It's written forever, motherfucker. That's what the guy told me. It's written. <laughs> you wrote it, so it's so. And I'm like, oh. I mean, we had to get security. That guy was ready to bend my nose because I had written this phrase. So now my Axel phrase is always, um, uh, I like my pharmaceuticals, but I'm no killer. And man, just try to spell pharmaceuticals. Uh, three thousand times a day, uh, it'll wear you. It'll wear you out, and I'm not even talking. You, you Sharpie has no chance. Um, so, th so that's that's always funny. Uh, there's always someone doing something to someone else, um, putting something in their drink that is unpleasant because you're kind of on performance. You know, you you've got a lot of people in front of you. You're trying to be really magnanimous. And then if something goes astray, like, what the hell, um, uh, then it can throw your whole day off. Or a smell. Kane Hodder's very good at this stink bomb, this spray that he has, and he'll spray it around your And <laughs> your line will dissipate very quickly. I mean, <laughs> the problem with that is it's about $5,000 he's just blown out of there, you know? And uh, so he's he's worked my nerve on a couple of occasions, but it's you have to laugh. Um, I'd make him pay me back. <laughs> there's a payback, believe me. There's a payback, Kane. You'll get yours. Uh, so those those things can be uh, pretty funny. Um, I know one time uh, um, there was a. Uh, Rick Grimes look alike. And um, he was good. It was at a, a Walker Stalker and, uh, in Atlanta. And so I had him come over to my table and just talk to me. And people were like, oh my God, there's Andrew Lincoln. Andrew Lincoln's talking to Lou Temple. No, no, Andrew Lincoln's over there talking because he doesn't typically show up. And uh, I kept him there and I had people rolling through my line all day he was like a you know babe magnet you know um and so that was that was pretty funny and i never said that it was andrew lincoln just someone that looked like and i just talked to him like we were having a conversation like this but you know and people would ask him and he he would say no i i can't sign i'm sorry i can't sign and he wouldn't engage with people and it, it really it, it worked it was it was funny rather it was kind of funny um there have been days where the night before has shown up in the form of pictures on the internet, like at some bar, uh, of Coyote Ugly style, where uh, you've got the walk of shame, 
that you, you know, you go in, you go, oh my God, they took pictures of me doing that. Uh oh, you know, where Rooker's giving you a hard time, like Jesus, what are you, you know, I got pictures that I wasn't even there. Um, yeah, there's just there's too many funny things to even. Uh, you know, recognize. Um, oh, here's a very funny thing. Actually, I uh, this this was in Canada somewhere, Winnipeg, or I was uh, doing a show. I was told to look for a white van to pick me up. You know, and the dumb actor just says, "Okay," and um, I guess the driver said, you're, you're going to the show and, and I'm with, there's these four young, uh, Korean girls who ultimately are a K-pop band, you know, <clears throat> don't speak a word of English. So I can't really, and, and the driver's like just some pizza delivery guy that they had hired to drive this van to go to a casino. And I knew I didn't actually know where I was going or maybe I, I got in the van. I'm riding shotgun. The four girls are in the back. Uh, nobody's talking. And we're talking like an hour drive. We show up at a casino. I'm like, oh, this is the hotel we're staying at. I show up and they're like, you're the manager. And I'm like, of who? Of the K-pop band. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not. I'm here doing the horror convention. What? We're not doing a horror convention. What horror convention? So somehow I get my agent on the phone. You know, I'm probably 100 miles away from where I'm supposed to be <laughs> with this K-pop band. Um, so that 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 was kind of comical. Um, they ended up they ended up getting me. But uh, I don't know if any of those stories are fun. But at the moment, at the time, they were they were for sure fun. <laughs> Mr. Temple, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. This has been an amazing interview. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to promote that's coming up? You sound busy. And I also want to give a quick shout-out to your cameo. Is there anywhere else you'd like to plug or shout-out? Well, yeah, uh, thank you. The cameo is great. If you want a shout-out, and I love doing birthdays, you know, those are fun. I broke up with a girlfriend and a boyfriend the other day. The dude had me. <laughs> Hey baby, I love you, but uh, he loves you, but it's it's done. D U N, flat gone. He's gone. It's not someone else. It's everyone else. He's dating up for the world. All right. So oh I just God. yeah. And so, uh, so that's kind of funny. I mean, you either have to commit to it, Nico, or you don't. So I just committed to it, and I'm sure I broke your heart. But uh, so cameo can be a real good time, and I'm out there. Uh, you know, you want to know what's going on. IMDb is good to see where I'm I'm uh, I'm working. I just finished a Western. It was my first work back on film uh, in Texas uh, since we've hit COVID. Uh, and it was great. Uh, we went through all the procedures and protocols to stay safe. We, uh, the Screen Actors Guild mandates that you test every 72 hours, of which we did. So and we were in a bit of a bubble environment. So I, I came back healthy tested out well um i know we're we're in a very strange time we've never experienced not just you who have had um memories of when this wasn't like this that was a thing on the walking dead as well we we talked often about what the memories of the kids carl or judith would have through that epidemic of which we're experiencing as an actuality right now and let's think of our kids you've got memories of your childhood where this wasn't part of it and these kids are forever going to be marred at least with this year of virtual school and not getting association with their friends and we we've got to figure out how to how to ease them through this and that'll help us through this too so um we we do have to have kindness and respect, um, regardless of what our, our opinions are. Uh, remember how you're the same. I think if we can get back to remembering how we're the same and just basic that we all have hearts, we all breathe, uh, we all have eyes. Some of them work, some of them don't. Um, 
look more about how you're the same as somebody as opposed to how you're different than somebody. And in through that commonality, I think some compassion comes back. And um, maybe we can do a little of that and um, and feel good about the human race, you know. And so uh, just asking everyone to look out for each other and, you know, smile. It makes the day better. And um, and and thank you. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed this. It's a good way to start your Saturday morning. Good cup of joe. And uh, and don't go out there. Stay right here. That's don't right. That was awesome. Go out there. Stay here. Uh, hey. Mr. Temple, can I ask you one more favor before you get out of here? You don't have to if you don't want to. Yeah. We, we have another fellow co-host who couldn't make it today. His name is Mike. Um, what actually got him into liking horror movies was the 2007 Halloween. Nice. And and he and he always quotes your line with Danny Trejo. What's the dish, Ishmael? You got feelings for this freak or something like that? I think that's how it goes. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you just say, what's the dish, Mike? You couldn't make my interview? Right. Okay. Hey, Mike, what's the dish? You couldn't make my interview? You got feelings for someone else? I don't know what you're doing, sweeping that dirt floor and taking care of all your papooses, your little babies. And I know you people are real good at cleaning up, but even still, you seem like you can make time for an old Halloween veteran like myself, but I guess you got better things to do, Mike. Well, anyway, good luck with them better things. Don't go out there because we're right here. You follow me? That was perfect. Thank you so much, man. All right. Well, thank hey. you, fellas. And, uh, you, you know, as your audience goes, keep listening and keep uh, as a, your preparation. Your questions are outstanding. And, and as a core group, you you all do a really great job. And I'm excited about your next guests. And, and I hope during this time of pause we've had, you've been able to be able to be real busy with it. Seems like you have. We've been booming. We definitely have. Yeah. <laughs> It's great. Congratulations. Well, you do a good job. You should. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Thanks. You have a great rest of the day, man. You as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks and so Brian, much. And Brian will send you the link whenever we get this posted. Great. I'll, I'll make sure that I I, uh, I go out and, and post it up on social media. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks. you. Take care, guys. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye.